إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد To all our brothers who are listening Welcome to our presentation on the commentary of the Sahih of Al-Imam Muslim Ibn al-Hajjaj Rahimahu Allah Ta'ala Sahih Muslim is one of the famous books of the Ahadith and it is the most authentic book after Sahih al-Bukhari according to the correct opinion of these scholars. This is a book which Al-Imam Muslim compiled at the request of his students so that it could be a compilation of authentic ahadith for his students and for the generations to come and to this day we find the Muslims benefiting from this compilation of his. He was born in An-Naysabur which is one of the cities of Khurasan. Khurasan being this current area occupied by Iran and Afghanistan. Al-Imam Muslim was a student of Al-Bukhari and he himself admits that the Sahih of Al-Bukhari is more authentic than his Sahih. And the crucial difference between them is that the conditions of Al-Bukhari are stricter than that of Al-Imam Muslim because Al-Bukhari says that we must have sure knowledge that the two reporters met with each other. As for Al-Imam Muslim he says, no, this is not a condition for him. For him it is just a condition that these two authentic reporters must have been contemporaries of each other but it does not need to be established that they actually met with each other hence because of this difference the Sahih of Al-Bukhari is more authentic than that of Al-Imam Muslim and there are differences also between the two Al-Bukhari focuses on the chapter title and then he will put the hadith under the chapter title and the hadith will prove the ruling which he is giving in the chapter title so what this means is that one hadith could appear under many many different chapter titles because one hadith could prove many different things which would therefore come under many different chapter titles as for the Sahih of Muslim it is a lot simpler in that all those ahadith which are of a similar topic are under one title hence you do not find too many ahadith being repeated in the Sahih of Muslim whereas in Al-Bukhari they are repeated all over the place so this makes Al-Bukhari a lot more difficult to follow and also to memorize. Also, we find in Al-Bukhari, many narrations are mu'allaq format, whereas you don't find this in Muslim. He has his narrations in musnad format, generally speaking, and of course there are some mawquf narrations as well. One of the specialities of the Sahih of Al-Imam Muslim is that it contains extremely crucial ahadith which we absolutely need, which you will not find in Al-Bukhari and which you will not find in many other ahadith books. Yet these ahadith in Muslim are extremely pivotal for us to form a fiqh opinion on a particular issue. And this is why the Sahih of Al-Imam Muslim is worth studying and going through from the beginning to the end. And this is what this presentation is about. We will read through the ahadith in Arabic, translate it, and give a commentary on it so that we can understand these ahadith properly, as opposed to misunderstand them, which so many Muslims are falling into and also to take the fawaid or the benefits of the ahadith so we can teach it to others and also implement it in our lives. Before we begin, we advise our listener, may Allah open up the doors of knowledge for you, to have Sahih Muslim with you ready at hand as you listen to this commentary. And also you are advised in the strongest possible sense to memorize those ahadith which are either short or medium sized length because at the end of the day your knowledge is what you have memorized not what you have listened to and you need to understand the difference and this is particularly important because sometimes when you're telling somebody something perhaps enjoying the good or forbidding the evil or just teaching someone you need to be able to quote the evidence to them so they can be satisfied of your opinion 
Because if you don't quote evidence to them, then all you're doing is that you're just giving them your opinion. The problem with that is that they can come back and counteract your opinion with their opinion. So it's just your statement against theirs. This is why it's crucial to bring the evidence into play and to understand the evidence properly. So you can link the evidence to the ruling which you are trying to prove. This is the key to any Sharia debate. A Muslim begins his Sahih with a Muqaddimah, which is the introductory section, in which he narrates many narrations which are talking about the authenticity of the narrator. So what the scholars of Ahadith are saying about a particular narrator. This is fine if you're interested in it, but we think that the listeners of this presentation will not be, because it is a specialist field, and it is for those who want to go deeper into knowing about the men in the chain of narration. However, from the Muqaddimah, we are going to pick out a couple of narrations which are worth mentioning. The first of these from Al Mughira ibn Shu'ba, that the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna kathiban alayya laysa ka kathibin ala ahadin, faman kathaba alayya mutaamidan falyatabawa maqa'adahu min al nar. He said, A lie against me is not like a lie against anyone else. So whoever says something against me which is not true intentionally, then let him take a seat in the fire. This hadith has reached a mutawatir level, which means it is as authentic as the Qur'an. And so this is extremely important to bear in mind nowadays, because it means if somebody is narrating from the Prophet something which the Prophet did not say, then this is a major sin, because a particular punishment now has been given. So if somebody says the Prophet said such and such, and he knows that the Prophet did not say it, then this is a major sin. Not only that, but making statements about the Prophet which are not true, also comes under this hadith. For example, you find many heretical Muslims nowadays making statements about the Prophet which are complete and utter lies. For example, they might say that I saw the Prophet in my dream, he came to me and he told me such and such a thing. And this information which they give, which they claim the Prophet told them, is supporting their own bid'ah, or has no basis in the Sharia. Or for example, them saying that the Prophet is present with us and he's looking at us even after his death because he was sent as a witness over us, and a witness is somebody who is present. So again, these are plain and shameless lies against the Prophet, and is a major sin, and these people need to prepare to take their seat in the fire. Or for example, them saying that the Prophet is made out of light. Again, a shameless lie against the Prophet, and exaggerating him and praising him more than his status, which is exactly what the Prophet forbade us to do. He said, لا تطروني كما أطرت النصارى عيسى بن مريم do not over-exaggerate in my praise, just as the Christians did with Isa ibn Maryam. إِنَّمَا أَنَا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ فَقُولُوا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ I am only the slave of Allah and His Messenger, so say, slave of Allah and His Messenger. So don't say any more than this, and don't over-exaggerate in your praise. And these people back up their deviant claims by misunderstanding ayat of the Qur'an, and also the narrations. But the point is that these are lies against the Prophet. If somebody says something against the Prophet, which is untrue, and he does not intend it, then he does not come under the threat of this hadith, because the hadith clearly mentions the word muta'ammidan, on purpose. However, one needs to bear in mind that there is another hadith in the Muqaddimah from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, كَفَى بِالْمَرْءِ كَذِبًا أَنْ يُحَدِّثَ بِكُلِّ مَا سَمِعَ It is enough as a lie for a person that he reports everything which he hears. So whenever you hear something, you report it to others without checking is it authentic or not. So this is enough for you as a lie. So it will hold true that you are lying. So whenever a report from the Prophet comes to us, the first thing that we need to do before anything else is to check its authenticity. Then thereafter we can talk about what rulings can be extracted from it. The other crucial hadith in the Muqaddimah from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, سيكون في آخر أمتي ناس يحدثونكم ما لم تسمعوا أنتم ولا آباؤكم فإياكم وإياهم There will be a people in the last part of my ummah who will tell you or speak to you about those matters which you have not heard nor your forefathers have heard of them. So beware of these types of people. So this hadith now is telling us that there will come a people towards the end part of this ummah who will speak about this deen but they will say things which are strange which the previous Muslims never knew about and never called to. And there can be no doubt that the Prophet is talking about the heretical groups and sects of this ummah who come out with strange opinions and a trademark of theirs is that they follow the mutashabihat. 
the unclear ayat. Those ayat which could be interpreted this way or that way. So they interpret these ayat or a hadith to suit their particular desires or their particular deviant, misguided madhab. And Allah Jalla wa'ala speaks about these types of people as well in Surah Al Imran, the crucial ayah number seven. هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ مِنْهُ آيَاتٌ مُحْكَمَاتٌ هُنَّ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ وَأُخَرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ He is the one who has sent down to you the book. From it there are those ayat which are singular in meaning. So there are no two ways about it. It's clear cut in its meaning. They are the main part of the book. So the rules and regulations are extracted from these ayat. And other ayat are mutashabihat, meaning unclear in its meaning. So it could be interpreted this way, that way or the other way. And it's unclear as to which the correct interpretation is. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْهُ بِتِغَاءِ الْفِتْنَةِ وَبِتِغَاءَ تَأْوِيلِهِ وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ So as for those people who have a deviancy in their heart, they chase after the mutashabihat, seeking fitna, meaning to draw people away from the correct path, and seeking its ta'wil or its interpretation. So they interpret it in accordance with their madhab. And nobody knows its interpretation except Allah. Meaning to say of the mutashabihat. وَالْرَاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا بِهِ كُلٌّ مِّنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا وَمَا يَذَّكَّرُ إِلَّا أُلُّ الْأَلْبَابِ But as for those firmly rooted in knowledge, they say, We believe in all of it, it is from our Lord, and none shall remember except those of sound intellect. And if we take a look at the reason for the revelation of this ayah, it is reported that some Christians from Najran came to the Prophet and they said that your own Qur'an says that Allah is not one, He is plural. Because Allah refers to Himself as we or nahnu in the Qur'an. So they're trying to imply the trinity and they're using the word nahnu or we in the Qur'an. So look how they are following the mutashabihat and they are completely ignoring the muhkam ayat which talk about Allah being absolutely one and unique. For example, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say, He is Allah, the one. This is muhkam, it is clear cut. There are no two ways about it. As for the nahnu or the we, then yes, we can mean plural, but it can also be the royal we. Just like the kings and queen, they use we to refer to themselves. You often find the shiyukh, when they give their lessons, they refer to themselves by saying we. And this is a royal we. It doesn't mean that you're physically plural. So nahnu can be interpreted this way or that, but as for the muhkamat, they can only be interpreted in one way. So when you have a clash between the mutashabihat and the muhkamat, then the true believers will take their rulings from the muhkamat. And the deviants will chase after the mutashabihat, just like these Christians were doing. And about this ayah, the Prophet commented that when you see those people following the mutashabihat, then they are the ones whom Allah has named in the Qur'an, meaning in this ayah. So beware of them. And likewise, we find in this hadith, which we have just quoted, in the muqaddimah, he is also telling us to beware of them. So these are the people who will follow the mutashabihat. To give an example of this, you will find some people saying that a woman can travel on a journey. We're talking about a long journey, of course, in which you could shorten your prayer. She can travel in this sort of journey without a mahram with her. And they will quote you the authentic evidence when the Prophet said that there will be so much peace that a woman will travel from Hira, which is a city up north, to Mecca and circumambulate the Kaaba, not fearing anyone except Allah. And clearly she is journeying without a mahram. So they say, look, in times of peace, a woman can journey without a mahram. But they will completely ignore the very, very direct order of the Prophet that any woman who believes in Allah in the last day must not travel except that there is a mahram with her. So this latter hadith, there are no two ways about it. It's clear cut in meaning and there's only one interpretation. As for the other one, then at best it is mutashabih because you might argue the Prophet is giving a tacit approval that a woman can travel alone. But at the very same time you can argue, no, the Prophet is informing us what will happen in the future. He is not saying whether it is halal or haram. Just like he informed us of many things which will happen in the future, like Muslim armies fighting each other. He is not talking about whether it's halal or haram, he's just saying it will happen. In the same way he told us that you will follow the sunnah of those who are before you, such that if one of them enters the hole of a lizard, you too will follow it. Does this mean now it's halal to follow the sunnah of those who are before us, meaning the Yahud and the Nasara? The answer is of course it's not. But the Prophet here is not telling us whether it's halal or haram, he's just telling us this is what will happen. Likewise, one of the signs of Qiyamah, a man will pass by a grave, 
and he will say, oh would that I was in this grave. So does this mean the Prophet is saying it's permissible during times of fitna to wish for death? The answer is of course not because we have clear-cut evidence which tell us that you are not allowed to wish for death. So how can we now chase after the mutashabihat and leave the muhkam? This is the methodology of the people in whose hearts there is a deviancy. So these are the types of people this ayah is talking about and also this hadith in the muqaddimah is talking about. And you will find other types of newly invented opinions coming out. For example, music is halal and women can sing to non-mahram men and vice versa. Or that the woman does not need to wear the hijab because there is no evidence for it in the Qur'an. And they will bring out their misunderstood evidence. They may even bring out some statements of the scholars which are at best shad or anomalous. And the Muslim is not allowed to seek after the anomalies of the statements of the scholars. Because the one who does that and he seeks after the easiest opinions, then the scholars say he has become a zindiq, which is a heretic, an extremely corrupt Muslim. And some people say there is no difference between a zindiq and a munafiq. So the point about this hadith, beware of those people who come out with opinions which are not in accordance with the orthodox opinions of the classical scholars. So be aware of new tafasir of the Qur'an, be aware of those du'at, those callers, which you are not sure of their credentials. And only take your knowledge from those whom you are sure that they are upon the authentic methodology of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, both in terms of their aqidah and also in terms of their fiqh. So these were the narrations which we wanted to bring to your attention. So now let us move to the main part of the book. And the way we'll do this is that each chapter has numerous ahadith in it. So we will not quote every single ahadith because they are very similar in meaning. We'll just quote one hadith and if there are other wordings of this hadith which have some extra information then at most we'll just quote the extra information in the other wordings of the hadith but we will not quote the whole hadith just to save us time. The other thing we will not do is that we will not read out the whole of the isnad and this again to save time. Our numbering of the hadith will not be exactly the same as the numbering which you have in your copy. However, the ahadith are the same and this is the important point. Please have the book with you because this will help you to maximize your benefit from this presentation. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Kitabul Iman, the book of Iman. Al Iman in the Arabic language means to acknowledge something in a way which leads to you accepting and submitting to that which you have acknowledged. So if you have Iman in Allah, and all the other five pillars of Iman, it means you acknowledge it in a way so as to accept it and submit to it. So based upon this, Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet, did not have any Iman, even though he acknowledged that the deen of the Prophet was in fact the best of all the Adiyan. He wrote poetry to this effect. But he did not have Iman, despite this acknowledgement. Why is this? Because this acknowledgement of his did not lead him to accept and submit to the truth and to accept that Allah is the only God worthy of worship. But what is the reason for this? The reason is because he did not want to be seen as a traitor who betrayed his forefathers. And this partisanship to your forefathers is something which Abu Jahl excited in Abu Talib. Otherwise there was every chance that Abu Talib would have accepted Islam at his deathbed. In the same way Hiraqal, the emperor of the Europeans, he acknowledged that the Prophet was in fact the promised Prophet. So this acknowledgement is not good enough for him to have Iman because it did not lead him to accept this Prophet and submit to the deen of the Prophet. But again the question is why is this? If you can acknowledge why can't you take the next step and submit? We say in his case if he was to submit it would mean he would have to lose the power which he had as the ruler of the Europeans. So his greed for power prevented him from Iman. So there's a difference between acknowledgement and Iman. In the same way somebody could acknowledge that the Qur'an is the book of Allah. Maybe a scientist finds certain ayat in the Qur'an and he realizes that this could not have been known over 1400 years ago. And the only viable explanation is that this is a message sent from a divine being. But this mere acknowledgement does not turn him into a Muslim because it is not Iman. If it is not followed by Al-Qabul which is acceptance and Al-Idha'an which is submission. As for Al-Iman, in the technical Sharia sense we say Al-Iman is the statement of the heart and the tongue and the actions of the heart and the limbs. It increases with good deeds and decreases with evil deeds. 
So when we say statement of the heart, this actually means the belief. So if you believe in Allah as the only God worthy of worship, this is the statement of the heart. As for the statement of the tongue, this is simple enough. It's when you utter the words of the shahada. As for the action, then actions are part of your iman, and the forthcoming ahadith will make this very clear. So your actions, for example, performing your salah, performing your psalm, your hajj, your zakah, helping somebody, removing a harmful object from the road, this is part of your iman, it's a physical action. And any physical action is part of your iman. Likewise, you have actions of the heart. For example, your love and your fear of Allah Jalla wa'ala, your tawakkul, your shyness. These are all actions of the heart. Meaning to say, you're moved by this particular action inside yourself. So you're not physically moving, but the emotions are. So we say these are actions of the heart. Hence, al-iman is statement and action. It increases and decreases. And we do not say it remains the same. Because this is a deviant belief. So this is the definition of al-iman, both in the language and in the sharia technical sense, and this needs to be memorized. And so therefore we also need to say that you should write down any useful points of benefit which you come across in this presentation, so that you do not forget them. And at the end of each track, we'll just have a few revision questions to see if you've been awake or sleeping, the chapter of explaining what is meant by al-iman, al-islam, al-ihsan, and the obligation of having iman in the qadr of Allah, and also that the Muslim is free from the one who does not have iman in the qadr of Allah, and that these types of people should be spoken out against in harsh terms. Hadith number one from Yahya ibn Ma'mar, he says that the first one to speak something deviant about the Qadr of Allah in Basra, which is the famous city in Al-Iraq, was a man called Ma'bad Al-Juhani. So Yahya says that I and Humayd ibn Abdurrahman Al-Himyari went to perform either the Hajj or Umrah. And they said that we said, if we meet anyone from the Sahaba, we will ask the Sahaba about this opinion, which is becoming widespread in Basra, about the Qadr. So he said, we met with Abdullah ibn Umar, the famous companion, and he was inside the masjid. So he said, I and my companions surrounded him, one to his right and one to his left. And he says, I said, I am Abu Abdurrahman. And he told Ibn Umar that there appeared some people from where we are. They recite the Quran and they seek knowledge. And he mentioned many other things about these people. And from them he said, and they claim that there is no qadr. And that matters which happen, just happen out of nowhere, so that Allah Jalla wa'ala does not will them to happen. So Ibn Umar replied, If you meet these people, then tell them that I am free of them, and they are free of me. Meaning to say, that I have nothing to do with them, and they have nothing to do with me. By the one whom Abdullah Ibn Umar is taking an oath by, if one of them had the fill of Mount Uhud in gold, and they were to spend it in charity, Allah will not accept it from them until they have Iman in Qadr. And then Ibn Umar reported this hadith to prove his point. He says that his father, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an said, so now Ibn Umar is reporting from his father, who is reporting this hadith. And so Umar said, whilst we were sitting with the Prophet والسلام, one day, a man came up to us with extremely white clothes and extremely dark hair. There were no signs of journeying on him and none of us knew who he was. And so this man came and sat next to the Prophet, and he put his knees on the knees of the Prophet, and he put both his palms on his lap, so one each. His right palm on his right lap, and his left palm on his left lap. And he said, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni anil Islam. O Muhammad, inform me about Islam. And the Messenger replied, Al Islam, أن تشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمدا رسول الله وتقيم الصلاة وتؤتي الزكاة وتصوم الرمضان وتحج البيت إن استطعت إليه سبيلا Islam is to testify that there is none worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and for you to establish the prayer to give the zakah to fast Ramadan and to perform the hajj at the house if you are able to make a way there. And so this man replied, Sadaqta, you have spoken the truth. And Umar said, so we were shocked, how can a man ask? And then tell the answerer, you have spoken the truth. Then he asked, then inform me about Al-Iman. And the Prophet replied, 
أن تؤمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسوله واليوم الآخر وتؤمن بالقدر خيره وشره that you have iman in Allah his malaika his books his messengers and in the final day and that you have iman in the qadr the good of it and the evil of it and the man replied sadaqta you have spoken the truth then he asked the third question فأخبرني عن الإحسان inform me about الإحسان or doing good or it is when you do something perfectly or in a good way and so the Prophet replied أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك that you worship Allah as if you are seeing him and though you see him not he sees you then the man replied then inform me about the sa'ah or the final hour and the prophet replied mal mas'ulu anha bi'a'lama min as-sa'il the one who is questioned is no more knowledgeable than the questioner then he asked then inform me about some of its signs and the prophet replied an talid al-amatu rabbataha wa an tara al-hufat al-urat al-alata ri'a' al-sha'i يتطاولون في البنيان He said that you will see the slave woman give birth to her master and that you will see the barefooted, naked, poor shepherds competing in building lofty buildings So Umar says Then this man went off and I stayed for a little while and then the Prophet said to me يا عمر أتدري من السائل Oh Umar, do you know who the questioner is? And I replied, Allah and His Messenger know better. The Prophet replied, فَإِنَّهُ جِبْرِيلُ أَتَاكُمْ يُعَلِّمُكُمْ دِينَكُمْ It is Jibreel, he came to teach you your deen. So this is the hadith which Ibn Umar quoted from his father. And he quoted this whole hadith which really encompasses the whole deen of Al-Islam. He quoted the whole of this just to prove the importance of belief in Al-Qadr. So that is the shahid of this hadith. Otherwise, you could probably write a whole book for the explanation of this hadith. But our focus here is on the qadr, which is the reason why this hadith was issued by Ibn Umar. When it comes to al-qadr, this is one of the most important topics in al-aqidah, and we have spoken about it in our audio presentations on aqidah. But to give you the overall picture, when it comes to the qadr, there are three madhahib. Number one, these are the Qadariyah who deny Qadr. They say that Allah Jalla wa'ala does not will the events to happen and He does not create the events which take place. Rather, they just happen out of nowhere and it has nothing to do with Allah Jalla wa'ala. And these are the types of people whom Ibn Umar was informed of by these two men who came from Al Basra. So we find that the Qadariyah originated from Al Basra. And many other deviant ideologies also originated from Al-Iraq, like the Khawarij and others. The extremists of the Qadariyah also claimed that Allah does not even know what is going to happen in the future. So not only does He not make it happen, but He also does not know it was going to happen. But these are the extreme faction from amongst them. Otherwise, most of them say that Allah does know the future, but He doesn't actually create the events which happen. The extremists amongst them who deny even the knowledge of Allah, they will have their ayat of the Qur'an as evidence. For example, in Surah Muhammad, Allah says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ حَتَّى نَعْلَمُ الْمُجَاهِدِينَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّابِرِينَ وَنَبْلُوَ أَخْبَارَكُمْ And we shall surely test you until we know who are those who will strive in our cause from amongst you, and that we may know who are the patient, and we will certainly test your facts meaning who is truthful and who is a liar. So they say, Allah says, we will test you until we know who will be striving in our cause. So this proves that before that, Allah did not know. Otherwise, he would not need to test anyone if he knew already. But most of the Qadariya deny that Allah willed the event to happen and that he created it. The second group, and this is the other extreme, are the Jabariya. The verb Ajbara in Arabic means to force somebody to do something. They say that every action which a person performs, he is forced to do that action and that humans have no willpower whatsoever. So whatever they're doing is not through their own will, rather it is Allah forcing them to do it. So not only do they affirm the qadr of Allah, they go to extremes in affirming it. They have their evidences, the statement of Allah, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَن يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ You do not will, 
Rather, it is Allah, the Lord of the world, who wills. So they're basically saying now that you do not have a willpower. Rather, Allah wills everything to happen. Likewise, in Surah Al-Baqarah, at the end of Ayah 253, وَلَوْ شَاءَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَفْعَلُ مَا يُرِيدُ And if Allah had so willed, they would not have fought each other, but Allah does what He wants to. So clearly they say, this ayah is showing, that they fought each other because Allah made them fight each other. And if Allah wanted to, He would have made them not fight each other. However, Allah does what He wants to. So you human beings are basically on strings. You have no choice, you have no willpower. You are being forced to do everything you do. Good actions, evil actions, just like a baby plays with his toy soldiers and moves them wherever he wants them to go. So the humans are like toy soldiers for Allah Jalla wa'ala. He plays with the humans however he wants to. And before the Qadariya in Al-Iraq, we had the Khawarij and the Rawafid. In fact, the Khawarij appeared right at the time of the Prophet. A man called Dhul Qawaisira who accused the Prophet of being unjust when he was distributing the wealth. However, the Khawarij formed their own band at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib when he was the Khalifa and they settled in a city called Harura in Al-Iraq. Then thirdly, you have the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and they are in the middle between the two extremes. They say that humans do have a willpower and when they perform this action, they are responsible for performing it. So this is why they will be rewarded and punished accordingly. However, all of this happens through the knowledge of Allah and His will, and Allah creates our actions. So our actions are a creation of Allah Jalla wa'ala. So whatever happens on planet Earth, it does not leave the control and grasp of Allah Jalla wa'ala. We take from the narration that the statement of Ibn Umar, who says that if they had Mount Uhud weight of gold, and they were to spend it, then it will not be accepted from them. So this statement means that Ibn Umar is actually making takfir upon them because if a kafir spends in charity, Allah Jalla wa'ala will not accept it from him. And this is in agreement with the ayah of the Qur'an وَمَا مَنَعَهُمْ أَن تُقْبَلَ مِنْهُمْ نَفَقَاتُهُمْ إِلَّا أَنَّهُمْ كَفَرُوا بِاللَّهِ وَبِرَسُولِهِ And nothing prevented the charity from being accepted except that they disbelieved in Allah and His Messenger. So if you are a kafir outside the fold of Islam and you were to spend in charity, then this would not be accepted from you. And this is a similar statement now which Ibn Umar is making about them. So it appears to us that Ibn Umar is making takfir of the people who deny Qadr. And he also says that I am free of them and they are free of me. Again indicating that they are kuffar. Because a kafir is free from the Muslim and a Muslim is free from the kafir and this is well known. We also take from the hadith that the early generations would refer the problems to the people of knowledge, just as we find these two men from Al-Basra doing, going to Ibn Umar and asking him. So if anyone comes up with something new, or something which may sound weird, and not in accordance with the spirit of Islam, then you always refer it to the people of knowledge, the knowledge of whom you trust. And they are reputable people of knowledge known to be from the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah who speak with evidence, and not just mere opinion. And we can also take the fa'idah that it is crucial for us to ask Allah Jalla wa'ala to keep us firm on the correct path and not to make us those who are deviated. As we find in the Quran, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَّابِ Our Lord, do not deviate us after you guided us and grant us mercy from you. Verily, you are the one who bestows. And also we find the dua which the Prophet والسلام, would open his nighttime prayers with. It mentions at the end of it, اهدني لما اختلف فيه من الحق بإذنه إنك تهدي من تشاء إلى صراط مستقيم Guide me to that which they differed meaning guide me to the truth about which the people are differing so controversial opinions on which there is a difference such as this Qadr of course Verily you are the one who guides to the straight path So this is a dua which is recommended to learn when you are opening your nighttime prayers Also Ibn Umar took an oath Without being asked to take an oath, this is permissible if there is a need. Indeed, in the Qur'an there are three places in which Allah orders the Prophet to take an oath. And this is because you want to emphasize or stress something which is crucial. Otherwise, if there is no particular need to emphasize something, then you should not take an oath. Allah says, وَحْفَظُوا أَيْمَانَكُمْ And preserve your oaths. And from the tafsir of this is that you should not take oaths frequently because they will lose their value. We also take from the hadith that an angel can appear in the form of a man 
which the other people can see, meaning the other people apart from prophets. And normally Jibreel would come to the Prophet in a form of a man, not in his original form as an angel. The Prophet did see Jibreel in his original form as an angel twice. And we also take that if you know what the answer is, you can still ask the question if it is going to benefit others. Because here Jibreel, of course he knew the answer, but he was asking the Prophet to benefit the companions. And this is what we realize at the end of the hadith. Also we take from the hadith that in circles of knowledge, you should sit close to the teacher. And this is from the etiquettes of circles of knowledge, in that the closer you sit, the more you will benefit. And the further away you sit, the less you will benefit. And we also take this from the hadith, which is also found in the sahih, about the three men who came to the circle of the Prophet. One of them sat inside the circle, the other one sat behind the circle, and the third one did not even sit anywhere, he just left. And the Prophet said, as for the one, who sat in the circle, then he sought shelter with Allah, and Allah sheltered him. As for the second one, he was shy, so Allah was shy of him. And as for the third one, he turned away, so Allah turned away from him. So you can see then that these three men took benefit of varying levels. As for the one who turned away, he had no benefit. And on the other end, the one who sat in the circle, he took most benefit, because Allah sheltered him. We also take a crucial point from this hadith, it is that the one who causes something to happen, is like the one who directly undertook that action. Because the effect of this event here was that the Sahaba learnt about the deen. But who was teaching them the deen? Clearly the one giving the answers and the knowledge was the Prophet. But Jibreel السلام, was the cause of it all. So this is why the Prophet said, Jibreel came along to teach you your deen. Despite the fact that it was the Prophet who was teaching the Sahaba the deen. Because all the answers were coming from him. So the Prophet was directly undertaking the action and Jibreel was the cause. So we say that, because the action of the Prophet, who was directly undertaking the action of teaching, was as a direct result of the cause, who is Jibreel, then Jibreel takes the credit of teaching the Sahaba, the Deen. Similarly, if we have two witnesses in a court, and they testify that such and such a person committed unlawful intentional murder, and so this person is therefore killed, and then we find that these witnesses were actually lying, and this becomes known that they were lying, and they are made to confess that they are lying. So now we've had an innocent person who died. Are these two witnesses to be killed therefore because they were the cause of this person's death? Or do we kill the actual executioner of the Khalifa who directly killed the innocent person? We say we do not kill the executioner because his action was as a direct result of the cause. And the cause of course are the two witnesses Therefore we say the witnesses take the credit for the death of the innocent person and they are to be put to death, both of them. If the action of the one directly undertaking the action is not as a direct result of the cause, then the cause does not take the credit. For example, a person digs a well in the middle of the street where people are walking. Of course this is a stupid action and you're just asking for an accident. So somebody is walking on the street and he falls into the well and dies. So we say the one responsible for this death is the one who dug the well up because this death now is a direct result of the cause even though the man himself walked into the well but it was a direct result of the cause. On the other hand however if somebody was to push another man into this well which is dug in the road and the man dies then who is to blame? The one who pushed the man or the one who dug the well? We say the one who pushed because he directly undertook the action and this action of his is not as a direct result of the cause it is independent of the cause so notice the difference here when the one directly undertaking the action is as a direct result of the cause or if it is not as a direct result of the cause if one man throws another man into a lion's den and the lions eat him up clearly the lions are undertaking the direct action However, in this case, the lions cannot be taken into account. That's impossible. So in this case, we give the credit of the death of the innocent person to the one who threw the dead into the lion's den. So if it is the case that the one who directly undertakes the action cannot be taken into account, then the blame goes to the cause. We take from the hadith that there is a difference between al-Iman and al-Islam. If they are both used individually on their own, then Iman is Islam and Islam is Iman as you cannot have Iman without Islam and vice versa. 
But when they are mentioned together, then there needs to be a subtle difference. And the difference is, as explained in this hadith, your iman are your belief systems. So this is the belief in the heart. Nothing to do with physical action. And Islam is your physical action, as we can clearly see in this hadith. But this is only when they are mentioned together. Iman and Islam. Some people say that Iman and Islam are one and the same thing. They take their evidence from the Qur'an in Surah Al-Dhariyat. فَأَخْرَجْنَا مَنْ كَانَ فِيهَا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فَمَا وَجَدْنَا فِيهَا غَيْرَ بَيْتٍ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ So we took out from the city those who were the mu'mineen, those who had Iman. But we did not find a house in the city except one house of the Muslimin. So these are two ayat. In the first one, Mu'mineen is mentioned and in the second one, Muslimin. So they say that Muslimin and Mu'mineen are interchangeable. Hence, Iman and Islam are the same thing. We say, no, this is not correct. In fact, this is an evidence against you, not for you. Because the angels are taking out those who have Iman, the believers. But they only found a house of the Muslimin. This is because the wife of Lut alayhi salam outwardly was a Muslim, so she was performing Muslim actions. But inwardly, she did not have any Iman. So she was called a Muslim, but not a Mu'min, because she did not have any Iman. So the Malaika took out the Mu'mineen, but not all of the Muslimin, because the wife of Lut alayhi salam was left behind, and she was destroyed along with the rest of the disbelievers. And we also take that having Iman in Al-Qadr is one of the pillars of Al-Iman. And of course there are six pillars given here, as well as five pillars of Islam. Each of these five pillars is a whole discussion by itself, which is outside the scope of the commentary of this hadith right now. Likewise with the six pillars of Iman, the place for that is presentations on Aqidah. But as for the Qadr, you notice that he said, the good of it and the bad of it. So the question is, is the Qadr of Allah bad? We say that the Qadr is from the actions of Allah. And no action of Allah can ever be bad. As in the hadith, وَالشَّرُّ لَيْسَ إِلَيْكَ An evil or anything bad cannot be ascribed to you, as the Prophet said to Allah in his da'a. So we say, Qadr can never ever be bad. Because the actions of Allah can never be bad. However, if there is something negative or something harmful, or something giving an annoyance, it is in the event which takes place as a result of the Qadr of Allah. So there's a difference between the Qadr, which is the action of Allah, and the Maqadur, that which is destined. So if we take a look at illness, if you fall ill, this is Shar. This is something bad which happens to you, and nobody wants to fall ill. Nobody enjoys being ill and bedridden. So clearly this is causing you some inconvenience and some pain and you want to get yourself out of this situation, which is why you're taking medicine. So this evil or something which is bad or inconvenience is in the maqdur. As for the qadr itself, there is a great good behind it in that it will extinguish your sins. So in the action of Allah itself, this is good because you'd rather be taking your punishment in this world than in the hereafter. So this is actually Allah doing you a favor. But the event itself is causing you pain. So it's shar from that angle. But it is khair or good from the angle of the action of Allah in that it is actually a blessing for you. It's just like how the English say every cloud comes with a silver lining. So we say Allah Jalla wa'ala never decrees pure out and out harm. There is always a wisdom behind his action. You can compare this with other human beings because another human may well intend pure harm for you. For example, you're walking in the street and somebody comes to attack you, to rob you of your money and your possessions. Now ask yourself, does this person who is attacking you and wanting to rob you of your money and your possession, does he want any good for you, even a little bit of good? The answer is, of course, no, he doesn't. He doesn't care whether you live or die. He's prepared to kill you for your possessions. He does not want an ounce of good for you. So if he robs your wealth from you and maybe injures you and possibly even kills you, then he himself did not want any good for you. He wanted pure out-and-out out evil. But at the same time, it also holds true that this event which happened, happened as a result of the Qadr of Allah. Allah willed it to happen. And clearly this event was evil, because it caused harm, injury, and bloodshed, and possibly even your life. However, did Allah Jalla wa'ala want out-and-out out evil for you? The answer is no. This is the difference between the action of the assailant who attacked you 
and the action of Allah. Because if you were robbed of your wealth or you were injured, then this will be a means of expiation of your sins and also a means for you to increase your grades in Jannah. And if you died as a result of you protecting your wealth, then we know the famous hadith, Man mata duna malihi fahuwa shaheed. Whoever dies protecting his wealth, then he is a martyr. Hence he will be given from the highest stations in Jannah. So with Allah Jalla wa'ala, he never intends pure out and out evil for you. Even if some of the events which take place as a result of the qadr of Allah may well be painful and inconvenience you. However, other human beings do intend out and out pure evil for you. So the point is, when we talk about the negative aspects of the qadr or the evils of it, then it is actually the evils of the maqdur, the event which takes place, not the actual qadr itself. The qadr is all good because anyone of a sound intellect would agree that a negative event which brings a greater good has to be good. And a negative result which has a greater wisdom behind it has to be something which is good. Somebody might counteract this argument and give you a scenario and he will tell you this is certainly an evil event. So if Allah had willed it, what could be the wisdom behind it? And perhaps you're stumped for an answer. What could be the wisdom behind this evil event? It's clear enough to see the wisdom behind you falling ill or you being attacked. But if somebody was to bring you an event which takes place, which is clearly evil or destructive or something negative, and he says, okay, what's the wisdom behind this event then? You may not know the wisdom behind this event, but that does not mean it doesn't exist. And your quick, easy get out of jail card for these types of questions is that with some events, the greater wisdom and the greater good behind it cannot be known until the future. And seeing as though it's not possible to know what the future is, it thus stands to reason that it is not possible to know what the greater wisdom behind this action of Allah is. Sometimes the wisdom becomes known to us in the future in this life, and sometimes the wisdom will become known to us in the afterlife. And seeing as though the kuffar do not believe in the afterlife in the very first place, there is no way they will be able to appreciate that the qadr of Allah always has a greater good and a greater benefit and wisdom. But that is their problem, not the Muslim's problem. As for your belief in Al-Qadr, this cannot be complete until you have four points in this belief of Al-Qadr. And these are as follows. Number one, that Allah knows what is going to happen, both the individual events and everything as a whole. Number two, He has written all of this down. And the evidence for both of these points, firstly in Surah Al-Hajj, Ayah 70, أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ فِي كِتَابِ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ Do you not know that Allah knows all that which is in the heaven and the earth? Verily, this is all in the book. Verily, that is easy for Allah. So it is all written down in the Al-Lawh Al-Mahfuz, the preserved tablet. Likewise, in Surah Al-Hadid, Ayah 22, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِ أَنَّ بَرَأَهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ No calamity befalls in the earth nor in yourselves, except it is written in the book before we create it. Verily that is easy for Allah. So both of these ayat are talking about the fact that Allah knows what is going to happen and He has written it down. The third point is al mashiah which is the will of Allah. Allah willed it to happen. It doesn't mean to say that it is beloved to Allah because Allah can will things to happen which are not beloved to Him. But the point is whatever took place Allah willed it to happen and whatever did not take place Allah did not will it to happen. Nothing can happen in the dominion of Allah Jalla wa'ala except by His permission. And whatever action you perform certainly it happened by your will as a direct result but also it happened by the will of Allah as a decree of Allah Jalla wa'ala. This is because nothing can take place in the dominion of Allah except that he needs to permit it. If you imagine you are in a castle of a king, certainly you have a willpower and you can do what you want and you have door A to your left and door B to your right. Is it possible for you to go through door A without the king allowing you to do so? The answer is no because you cannot do anything in his castle except if he permits you. You can't go anywhere you want to without his permission. Likewise, could you go through door B without the king allowing you? The answer will be no. You do not have authority to do in the castle of the king 
as you want to without his permission. So let's suppose now the king allows you to go through door A, and as you walk through door A, you fall in a pit of fire. Can it be said that the king forced you to go into the fire, or did you do it out of your own will? The answer is you did it out of your own will for sure. The king did not force you to go through door A, but this is what you chose and you fell into the pit of fire. If on the other hand you chose to go through door B and the king allowed you to, and as you go in through door B, you find yourself in a garden beneath which rivers flow, can it be said that the king forced you to go through door B? Or did you do it out of your own volition? Clearly the answer is you did it out of your own volition, and the king did not force you. But at the same time, you could not have entered either door A or door B without the king's permission. This is the point. So whether you end up in Jahannam or Jannah, it cannot be said that Allah forced you to take that particular path. Rather, you did it out of your own choice, but the king allowed you, such that you would not be able to do it if the king didn't allow you. So if this little scenario is true for the king's castle, then what about the king of kings, who is Allah Jalla wa'ala, who owns much more than a castle. He owns the heavens and the earth. Hence we find nothing can happen in the heavens and the earth except by the permission of Allah Jalla wa'ala. So your willpower is underneath the willpower of Allah. And this is the correct understanding of the ayah, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ You cannot will, except it be that Allah, Lord of the world, wills. The fourth category is the khalq, which is the creation. Allah creates everything which happens. And Allah even creates your own actions due to the statement of Allah, وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَكُمْ وَمَا تَعْمَلُونَ And Allah created you and that which you do. So our actions are the creation of Allah. And the way to understand this is, for any action you perform, you need to have the willpower to perform that action and you need the physical ability to perform it. If one of these two essential ingredients is missing, then there is no way you're going to perform that particular action. So, for example, if you have the willpower to lift up a heavy rock, but you cannot physically do it, then you're not going to lift up the rock. But perhaps you have the physical ability to lift up the heavy rock, but you don't have the willpower to do it. Again, you will not lift up the heavy rock. So both these ingredients are essential. But when it comes to both of these essential ingredients, which are your willpower and your physical ability, we ask the question, where did they come from? And the answer, they are both the creation of Allah. Hence it holds true that your actions are in fact the creation of Allah as a decree of Allah Jalla wa'ala, but you directly undertake that particular action, which is why you will be rewarded or punished accordingly. And some may say, to perform any particular action, you need a willpower, the qudra or the physical ability, and you also need time and space, because no action can be performed without time and space. You need space to perform an action and also you need a time to perform that action in. But it's the same thing because then who created the time and space? Again, this is a creation of Allah. So it's the same thing then. Your actions are a creation of Allah. Because without Allah creating the essential ingredients for the action, you will not be able to perform the action. We also find from the hadith that Al-Ihsan is the highest station a Muslim can reach, which is that he worships Allah as if he is seeing Allah Jalla wa'ala. And even though he does not see Allah, Allah sees him. So now this sentence needs to be understood in two ways. The first way is your desire. So you worship Allah as if you are seeing him, so you're enthusiastic about your worship. Imagine if you can see Allah, your acts of worship will become so much more focused and they will be of a much higher quality. So if you worship Allah as if you are seeing him, then this will make you more desirous of worshipping Allah Jalla wa'ala. So that's the first perspective. The second perspective is, if you do not see Allah, then Allah sees you. How can we implement this in our lives? This will increase us in the fear of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Because you know that Allah is always seeing you. So outwardly, nobody wants to perform sins because they are too ashamed that people will see him performing this sin and it will damage his reputation. So it is far easier to perform these sins in private. But if you have reached the level of ihsan, then you know that even in private, Allah is watching you. So your actions are going to be righteous, whether they be done outwardly or inwardly. As opposed to the Muslim who is not conscious of the fact that Allah is watching him, his actions are likely to be righteous outwardly in front of other people, but inwardly he is likely to be committing sins. He is still a believer, no doubt, but he has not reached the higher levels in his Iman, which is the level of Al-Ihsan, when you do something good. 
We also take that no one knows when the sa'a or the final hour will occur. Here we find the best of the messengers from the humans is speaking to the best of the messengers from the malaika and both of them do not know. So if they don't know, then nobody knows except Allah Jalla wa'ala. From this hadith, we also learn about a couple of signs of Yawm al-Qiyamah. A slave girl gives birth to her master. What does this mean? Various explanations have been given, but the correct one is as follows, that it does not mean a particular slave girl will give birth to a child and this child will grow up to be her personal master. No. Rather, the hadith is talking about general terms, that a child will be born to a slave girl and he's going to grow up to be the ruler of a land. Why is this strange? Because you would never expect the son of a slave girl to grow up and become a ruler. So the affairs will become topsy-turvy. And he also says that the shepherds who are barefoot and destitute and naked, they will compete with each other who can build the highest or tallest building. Why is this strange? Because you would not expect these types of people to be building tall buildings, which are highly decorated and very flashy and expensive. Nowadays we see in certain Arab countries tall skyscrapers. Now these Arabs who own these tall skyscrapers, if you go back in their family tree, you are likely to find their forefathers were naked, barefooted, destitute shepherds. So both of these signs which the Prophet has given has a common thread running through them, which is role reversal from the lowest society to the highest level of society in terms of wealth and richness and authority. The Prophet asked Umar who the questioner was and he replied, Allah and his messenger know better. Is it permissible for us to say Allah and his messenger know better? We say when it comes to matters of the Sharia, then yes, Allah and his messenger do know better. But when it comes to other affairs not pertaining to the Sharia, then Allah alone knows best. So based upon this, it is not sinful to say Allah and his messenger know better when it comes to issues of the Sharia, even in this day and age. And some scholars say it is better to say Allah knows best without adding the messenger because the messenger is not alive with us nowadays. But either way, it is permissible. We find here that Jibreel said to the Prophet, Sadaqta, you have spoken the truth. So we ask the question, if a person comes to the Mufti to seek a fatwa and the Mufti gives a fatwa and the questioner says to the Mufti, you have spoken the truth, is this deemed to be good manners and etiquettes? The answer is no, it is not deemed to be good manners and etiquettes, and hence this should not be done. So why did Jibreel do it? We have to say this was something specific to him, and he was an angel, and you are not. However, when it comes to a matter which is extremely clear, then there is no problem in telling the shaykh or the one who is more knowledgeable than you, you have spoken the truth. And we find this happening, in fact, in the famous hadith where Abu Huraira was extremely hungry and he met the Prophet and the Prophet realized that he was extremely hungry and they went to the house and poured some milk out and the Prophet called for the Ahl Suffa, the people of Suffa, which is a place in the Prophet's masjid. And all of them drank from this one glass of milk until only Abu Huraira and the Prophet were left. And the Prophet said to Abu Huraira, only I and you are left. And Abu Huraira said to the Prophet, Sadaqta, you have spoken the truth. And this is not deemed to be rude because the matter is extremely clear. They all knew that only the Prophet and Abu Huraira remained now to drink from the cup. So if the matter is extremely clear, then there is no problem. Otherwise, this should not be said. End of track review questions. Number one, explain the meaning of Al-Iman linguistically and technically and give real life past examples which demonstrates that Al-Iman is not merely acknowledging something. Question number two, what are the three madhahib or schools of thought when it comes to Al-Qadr? Question number three, explain the four phases of the belief in Al-Qadr according to Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. And question number four, we believe in the Qadr, the good of it and the evil of it. Explain what we mean by the evil of it.